Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. Our first question from Shuna Robinson. To ask the Scottish Government what information it has regarding the impact of universal credit on food banks in Scotland in light of the Trussell Trust reporting an increase in its distribution of emergency supplies. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Universal credit takes money out of the pockets and food out of the mouths of some of the most vulnerable people in Scotland. And only last week, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty said that food bank use was up almost 400% since 2012, and food banks should not be stepping in to do the UK government's job. The Trussell Trust has also linked universal credit with an increase in demand for food banks, which is up 52% where universal credit has been rolled out. The Scottish Government has written to the new Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to repeat our calls for the rollout of universal credit to be halted as a matter of urgency. Shona Robinson. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Um, would the Cabinet Secretary join me in commending the invaluable work of food banks in Dundee, which have been stretched to capacity with the increasing impact of what the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty has now called universal dis credit, which has seen a 34% increase in food bank usage and a staggering increase of rent arrears by 54% across Dundee since last year. So will the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the Chancellor's claim that we've reached the end of austerity is simply not credible given these figures and the recent scathing UN report which utterly condemns these failures? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would, of course, commend the hard work that goes on in our communities who are supporting each other through exceptionally difficult times and in times of crisis. But it is shameful that the UK government continues to look the other way, despite the mounting evidence and even an intervention from the UN. I highlighted the impact of universal credit and food banks in my original answer. And causal evidence shows that average arrears for those in universal credit are two and a half times average the arrears on those that are housing benefit. The evidence is clear and the evidence is simple that universal credit, credit is causing stress, anxiety, increased rent arrears and increased debt across Scotland. That's why it must be stopped and stopped now. Question number two from David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how accessible universal credit is for people with prof profound and multiple learning disabilities. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Universal credit's digital by default approach makes it inaccessible for many people and of course this may be a particular issue for those with profound learning disabilities and their families and carers. The result of the DWP's own survey, in fact, shows that only 54% of claimants can make a digital claim unassist, unassisted. It is yet another example of universal credit failing the people who need it most and putting people at risk of not being able to access the financial support that they are entitled to. It is therefore vital that this and the many other issues with universal credit are addressed before millions of people are migrated over to universal credit beginning next year. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Cabinet Secretary, Adam is 18, blind, has no mobility, no means of communication, no capacity to make a decision, is fed by means of a G-tube and requires support to keep his airways open. Yet he and his mother have had to endure an interview, complete a multitude of forms and even obtain a sick note from his GP. We have just learned that the mayor also have to attend an assessment to evaluate his work capability. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this inhumane system is causing untold distress and anguish to the most vulnerable within our society and should be halted immediately by this uncaring Tory government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the member speaks very eloquently about uh, universal credit and I'm very sorry to hear about the situation that Adam finds himself in through absolutely no fault of his own. I'm sure members across the chamber will hear equally awful stories in their own surgery as individuals are forced through what is quite frankly an inhumane system and Adam's ex the example of, of Adam has brought that to the chamber once again today. As I said in my answer to Shona Robinson there is absolutely no doubt that universal credit is failing some of the most vulnerable people in our society Adam included. That is why we have written to the 
various Home Secretaries for work and pensions that we have had over the past 18 months. I wrote again to Amber Rudd uh, this week outlining the fundamental flaws of universal credit and particularly the digital by default um, example of that. That, for many other reasons, is why I have called once again on the Secretary of State to halt the rollout of universal credit. Question number three, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the findings of the UN Special Rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights following his two-week inquiry into rising levels of poverty and the consequences of austerity measures. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. The Scottish Government welcomed the UN Special Rapporteur's visit to the UK. Professor Alston's end-of-visit statement is a devastating critique of the UK Government's punitive, mean-spirited and often callous policies and the suffering and hardship that they have caused. The Scottish Government echoes Professor Alston's call for the UK Government to stop denying the evidence. The hard reality is that one-fifth of the UK population lives in poverty. Last year, 1.5 million people were reduced to destitution. And that is an absolute scandal. And yet again, a UN expert has laid bare the UK government's failures to guarantee the most basic of human rights, food, shelter, dignity to millions of its own citizens. Bill Kidd. I thank the Minister um, for that reply. And does she agree that integrate, integrating human rights into and throughout Scottish Government policy, a direct uh, direction that is the polar opposite of the Tory UK Government's take on politics, will build an increasingly equitable society. Cabinet Secretary. It's at the heart of everything that we seek to do as the Scottish Government, with all public authorities now having a duty to respect, protect and fulfil human rights. And that's why our own new national performance framework now has an explicit human rights outcome supported by 31 human rights indicators. And it's why we're taking practical action to implement Scotland's international human rights obligations. For example, Scotland's new social security system embeds human rights in its core legislative principles. And these principles go much further than just simply warm words. Every aspect of the new system is being developed in partnership with rights holders and we're designing a public service that meets their needs from the outset. A glimpse of an approach that Scotland can take if given the power and responsibility to deliver for the people of our country. And they stand in complete contrast to the policies of the UK government which keeps its head buried in the sand about the everyday misery, hardship and despair that it continues to cause. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that the devastating impact of UK Government policies on women's lives have been given specific attention by the UN Rapporteur's report, with women selling sex in order to pay for food and shelter, women as the vast majority of single parents facing significant hardship with the two-child cap, and women making up the majority of pensioners, many of whom are living in poverty. In addition, Philip Olsen specifically mentions the Scottish Welfare Fund, and of the thousands of households in Scotland receiving help from it, 54% were single people and 22% were single parents, but none of the Scottish Government data tells us if these are men or women. So why is the data not disaggregated by sex, disability or race to allow for more informed analysis of the take-up and reach of the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure it's actually contributing effectively to tackling the poverty which is faced by a disproportionate number of women in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, absolutely, and Elaine Smith is right to point out the, the gendered impact of uh, UK welfare uh, reforms and austerity and the impact, the devastating impact, the tragic, heartbreaking impact that it's causing to too many women across Scotland and the, U and the UK. Uh, and of course, we'll uh, seek to always do what we can around the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure that it can meet the needs of the people of Scotland, the people that it's designed uh, to help uh, in the face of these cuts that we are facing. I would point out that we're spending £125 million this year to mitigate the UK cuts. Uh, and by 2020-2021, £3.7 it will be cut from the Social Security uh, budget. But that is really difficult to sustainably always mitigate, but certainly where we can improve, and there are uh, recommendations for us in the Scottish Government to make improvements uh, to the way we uh, cope with these uh, uh, welfare uh, reforms to ensure that we can better uh, improve the uh, system in Scotland and certainly will continue to engage with Elaine Smith on those particular issues she raised around the gendered impact on uh, welfare and uh, reforms and austerity. And Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Continuing on that theme, the UN Special Rapporteur said that limiting benefit payments to two children was as, and I quote, forced and physical as China's one-child policy. What does the Cabinet Secretary make of his assertion that the UK welfare system is as sexist as if it were compiled by a room full of misogynists? That's his words. And how could she, could she outline if all, if all welfare were devolved to this place, what would the Scottish Government do differently as a priority? Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> 
Well, we certainly wouldn't have a rate clause. We certainly wouldn't have a two-cap child limit. And certainly uh, what I said and outlined to Bill uh, Kidd in my response, the social security system that we have built in Scotland that has been designed around dignity, respect and fairness gives a glimpse of what is possible when Scotland has the ability to cope and care for its people. That is one way we, we are currently delivering for the people of Scotland and if we had the full powers and competencies to make sure that we can, could care for everybody uh, in our country then we would deliver a system that didn't have things like the inexcusable rape clause uh, policy in this country. Question number four, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has for the creation of new national parks. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. There are no current plans to designate new national parks in Scotland. Finlay Carson. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that in light of the widespread support revealed by the public engagement exercise carried out by the Galloway National Park Association, the time has come for the Scottish Government to consider initiating a formal consultation on a possible Kingdom of Galloway National Park? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I think as the, uh, as the member knows, uh, this is an ongoing conversation that is being had not just uh, with uh, people from Galloway but from uh, other parts of Scotland where there are competing uh, interests in national parks. Uh, I know that the Minister was uh, uh, scheduled to meet the chairs of SCNP and GNPA on Tuesday morning. That meeting had to be postponed but is now being uh, rescheduled. But I would remind him of some of the comments uh, that I have uh, had to make in the past, uh, which is that there are financial considerations in all of this. Uh, and the, those financial considerations not only have not gone away, but actually, if anything, have become exacerbated. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Last week, I wrote to the Minister with regards to the establishment of considering a national park for Galloway. And given the national parks in Scotland have served the country well by providing the respective areas with an increase in visitor numbers, a growth in employment, a boost to local and rural economy, as well as having a positive impact on wildlife conservation, can I ask the Minister to commit to giving the prospect of a Galloway National Park serious consideration? Cabinet Secretary. Um, as I indicated, we're always happy to continue to engage uh, on the Galloway National Park um, Association proposals, indeed as we are with uh, other communities who are also thinking about national parks. The Minister does intend to meet with them to discuss their ideas, but any proposal would need to be assessed in the context of the very real concerns around public finances and the costs that would be associated with new national parks. Colin Smith. Does the Cabinet Secretary not accept that the campaign for Galloway National Park is in many ways a campaign about equality across rural Scotland and the benefits of national parks shouldn't just be for central and north Scotland but all of Scotland including the south which is an area that sadly is all too often forgotten? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think there uh, is a strong economic case uh, that is made for the uh, national parks and the whole of the national park uh, idea. There uh, I, I'm not entirely sure I would characterise uh, either of the two national parks as somehow being central belt. I, I suppose he, he means because the Loch Lomond and Trussels, Trussels National Park extends as far south as Balloch, but I'm not entirely certain people consider that uh, to somehow uh, be central belt. Both of them are uh, very rural. Both of them are indeed uh, helping uh, the rural economy. Uh, but, of course, with the south of Scotland, there are a lot of other things being discussed at the moment. And the Scottish Government is, of course, committed uh, to setting up a development agency in the south of Scotland, which will, in itself, uh, 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 is intended uh, to deliver economic benefits to that area. Question number five, Colin Beattie. Ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that the number of pupils learning a musical instrument fell by 1,000 between 2016-17 and 2017-18. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government recognises the value of instrumental music tuition to the well-being and attainment of young people. Any reduction in take-up is therefore a cause for concern. We are working with key partners to find ways to ensure that instrumental music tuition remains accessible to all. Local authorities in Scotland are responsible for ensuring that all children and young people have access to the full curriculum including the expressive arts. We are supporting local authorities by delivering a real terms increase in revenue and capital funding in 2018-19. Colin Beatty. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that the two local authorities in my constituency, Midlothian Council and East Lothian Council, 
are named in the report as being areas where hundreds of pupils are no longer registering for music lessons following the introduction of charges. Can you outline what support the Scottish Government can give both local authorities and pupils to ensure this drop in uptake is arrested? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, by coincidence, I was in Musselburgh Grammar School yesterday and there was a fantastic orchestral performance by the school orchestra in advance of the meeting of the Scottish Education Council. But one of the senior pupils of the school made the point to me that the changes made by East Lothian Council were deterring individuals from taking up instrumental music tuition and she was concerned about that point. So Mr Beattie makes a fair point. There is of course a, a, a varied position about music tuition charging around the country. There are a number of local authorities in the country, Dundee, Edinburgh, the Western Isles, Glasgow, Orkney, Renfrewshire and West Dumbartonshire, who apply no charge whatsoever for instrumental music tuition, but others that do apply charges. And I think individual local authorities need to take due account of the impact of these charges on the uh, participation and involvement of young people, because all of us want to see young people able to take part in the expressive arts. A working group led by the Chair of the Music Education uh, Partnership Group, bringing together representation from the Government and COSLA, is actively considering ways to ensure that instrumental music tuition remains accessible. Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, clearly music tuition is very important and it's important that everybody, regardless of their background, is able to access that. Does he accept that local authorities have had to cut their budgets by 1.5 billion since 2010 and as a result of that we are seeing cuts hit music, hit education uh, and teachers are under more and more pressure as a result of those cuts? Cabinet Secretary. Don't, I, don't, I don't think it's nearly as straightforward as that because in Dundee, Edinburgh, the Western Isles, Glasgow, Orkney, Renfrewshire and Western Bartonshire, the local authorities have decided within the current financial settlement they can afford to pay for instrumental music tuition. They have made the choice to prioritise that. Other local authorities have not made that decision as part of that. Now that's, local authorities have to make these choices. But the answer to all doesn't all rest with the Scottish Government, it rests with local authorities to take the right decision to support instrumental music tuition. Question number six, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recent Purple Tuesday, what action it's taking to support the improvement of retail experiences for disabled people. Minister Christina McKelvey. Um, uh, President Officer, we support the principle of accessibility that Purple Tuesday is promoting and believe that retailers should focus on accessibility and inclusion all year round. Effective solutions to the problems and barriers faced by disabled people must be drawn from their lived experience. That is why the Scottish Government funds volunteer-led access panels to work with planning authorities and businesses to improve access in local communities. I would strongly encourage retailers, councils and those promoting the economic development of local areas to involve disabled people and their organisations to improve accessibility and inclusion for all of their customers. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the Minister for that response? I've met uh, recently with a number of stakeholders in this area, including Scottish Red Cross, the Disability Equality Scotland and Ewan's Guide, who are all raising the issue of some unmet uh, availability of uh, mobility aids. So can I ask the Minister if the Scottish Government has any plans to introduce uh, some additional measures to support uh, these groups and to discuss this matter in detail with various retail groups. Minister. Yeah, um, I know that Liz Smith has had a, an ongoing uh, focus on this issue, um, but she'll, she'll understand that equality law recognises that bringing about equality for disabled people may mean changing the way in which services are delivered, providing extra equipment and or the removal of physical barriers. This is a duty to make reasonable adjustments, and this duty aims to make sure that a disabled person can use a service as close as it is reasonably possible to get to the standard usually offered to a non-disabled person. As I said in my earlier answer, the Scottish Government funds access panels, which are groups of volunteers who work together to improve physical access to the built environment and wider social inclusion and as far as Ewan's Guide and other organisations that are involved in this I'd be quite happy to meet with Liz Smith and those organisations in order to take forward some of the issues that they raise. Thank you. Question 7, Gail Ross. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many abattoirs there are. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Five approved red meat slaughterhouses, three poultry in Scotland. There are also 16 approved establishments that handle wild game and two authorised on-farm slaughter facilities for farm game. Gail Ross. 
to thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Many farmers and crofters in rural areas are faced with long journeys to get their animals slaughtered and butchered. What support could be given for local solutions such as mobile abattoirs, cooperatives or farm butchery? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding officer, as a proud advocate for and an enthusiastic consumer of high quality Scotch beef, lamb and pork, such a adequate provision is plainly vital and I'm aware of Gail Ross's uh, strong interest in this in pursuing matters for her constituents. I'm very happy to support any developments that are brought forward and work very closely with Gail Ross in her campaigning efforts. Thank you. That's